My name is Charles, and I serve as one of the pastors of Rama Baptist Church. We're glad that you've taken a few moments to watch one of our services. Each week, the body of Christ here at Rama gathers around the Word as we draw near to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have access in the Spirit to the Father. We pray as you watch this service today that you too would find yourself centered around the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. We do, however, want to encourage that you not allow watching these services online to become a substitute for you regularly gathering with the body of Christ. We believe that God has designed us as believers to live our lives in communion with one another through the gathering of the church, for Scripture reminds us of the importance of gathering with the people of God. Again, thank you for taking a few moments to watch one of our services. We pray that it serves you well. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As always, it is such a joy to worship and to gather together as God's people here at Ramah to glorify him in song and in deed and even in word and to have lives that are shaped by the word that we gather around each Sunday. As we begin our time of worship today, we'll do so by hearing from God in his word, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. If you're able, I'd invite you to stand with me as I read from God's word. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And so on this Palm Sunday, we respond to God's word by giving him praise. I invite you to sing with me, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing. Oh 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you with lifted voices and lifted hearts, praising you, for you indeed are king. No matter what the circumstances of our personal situations might suggest, no matter what the circumstances of the world around us might suggest, Father, we know that your Son, Jesus Christ, is King of kings and Lord of lords, and in that we rejoice. As we enter into this Holy Week season, when we intentionally focus our thoughts and our attention on what you did for us in a real place, in a real time, 2,000 years ago, Father, we thank you and we praise you for all that you've done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. As we continue our conversation with God, God has spoken and we have responded in song and in prayer. And God speaks to us again through his word, through Psalm 51. Would you hear this call to confession from Psalm 51? To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. The bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a call to confession. David puts into words thoughts that we hardly even go near. We don't want to think about our sinful condition long after Christ has saved us. We still sin. So David puts into words things that we need to think on. Pastor Laramie is going to sing a psalm setting of this text of Psalm 51. So even as you listen to him sing, God be merciful to me from Psalm 51, would you continue to set your mind and your thoughts on God's word? Thy judgment just 
Speechless I thy mercy trust. I am evil born in sin. Thou desirest truth within. Thou alone my Savior art. Teach thy wisdom to my heart. Make me pure, thy grace bestow. Wash me whiter than the snow. Broken, humbled to the dust, by thy wrath and judgment just, let my contrite heart rejoice, and in gladness hear thy voice. From my sins, O oh, hide thy face, blot them out in boundless grace. Gracious God, my heart renew, make my spirit right and true. Cast me not away from thee, let thy spirit dwell in me. Thy salvation's joy impart, steadfast make my willing heart. Sinners then shall learn from me, and return, O God, to thee. Savior, all my guilt remove, and my tongue shall sing thy love. Touch my silent lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall praise accord. Not the formal sacrifice hath acceptance in thy eyes. Broken hearts are in thy sight more than sacrificial rite. Contrite, spearing, pleading cries, thou, O God, will not despise. Prosper Zion in thy grace, and her broken walls replace. Then our righteous sacrifice shall delight thy holy eyes. Free will offerings gladly made on thy altar shall be laid. Let us pray. Father, we do come before you thankful for the sacrifice of Christ that offers our sinful souls forgiveness. Lord, let us always be cognizant of where we have come from in our lives, Lord, so that we can more rightly be thankful for the grace that comes from Christ. Lord, continue to forgive us of our sins. Help us to walk rightly in your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join me in singing of the work that Christ has done on behalf of us sinners as we sing together, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. You may remain seated, but let us sing together.
we consider the good news of Christ. Hear these words from 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Let us stand together, if you're able, as we sing in response to this wonderful, justifying truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. We stand forgiven 
seated. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word, turn once again to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and if you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's one in the pew there in front of you, and you can make your way there with us. If you're not sure how to find the passage, ask the person next to you. They'd be glad to help you find your place in the Scriptures in Matthew chapter 5. They tell you in seminary, in your preaching classes, that you should really have a a a catching illustration at the beginning of the sermon to help grab people's attention. Sometimes we hear the scriptures and we're not sure if we're interested or not. We're not sure how the passage might actually make any difference in our lives today. But with the passage we have before us today, an illustration to catch your attention is not necessary. I trust that all of us will be uh, eager to hear what the Lord is saying through his word in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27, and we all have been touched by this passage, and so I pray that we would each give our attention to God's Word, and uh, I appreciate your prayers for wisdom even as I preach. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27, if you found your place in God's Word, would you stand once again for the reading of the Scriptures? Matthew five twenty-seven down through verse 32. Jesus says, you have heard it that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. As hard as these words are to say and to hear, this is the word of God, and it is for the people of God. And so we give thanks to God. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, We understand that our culture has moved far past the application of your word. We are strange for seeking to live out the principles of your word, and we feel strange even seeking to study and apply them even at church. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside our distractions, that we would be able to focus on your word, your scriptures. And I pray that by your spirit we would understand, and not only understand, but that we would obey And that we would love you more for the goodness that you've shown to us through your word and through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, for those of you who uh, this happens to be your first time at Ramah, or for others, this is your first time in a long time that you've been at Ramah, just know that this is not normally how we do Palm Sunday. I didn't just happen to say, hmm, how can I catch their attention on Palm Sunday? No, we typically go through books of the Bible, and just in case you're keeping track, I will pause Matthew and preach a different passage next week for Easter Sunday. But we've been making our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and right now we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And we didn't arrive here uh, out of context, and Jesus didn't arrive here out of context. He has said something very important earlier in this chapter. He told the people listening that he did not come to abolish the law. So everything Jesus has to say is not in contradiction with the Old Testament. He didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And then he's begun to give six examples, six illustrations of how he himself is the one to fulfill and perfectly bring to fruition the Scriptures, the Old Testament words of God. But in verse 20, if you lift your attention there, be reminded, Jesus said something very shocking, startling. Verse 20, he said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. My goodness. Jesus has our attention. We need to know 
What does it mean to enter the kingdom of heaven? What does it mean that he's come to fulfill the scriptures? And what does it mean here, uh, these teachings about lust and divorce, and what in the world do they have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, Jesus has demanded superior righteousness of us. Not superficial righteousness, but superior righteousness. We're okay, even many professing Christians, with surface-level righteousness, but we don't want anything that goes any deeper than that. But Jesus demands a superior, far deeper than the surface righteousness. But let's be honest. We're often looking for loopholes. We want to figure out a way to get out of that. W.C. Fields was an entertainer, an actor, uh, well, about 100 years ago. He was in a lot of comedy films, and he was known to not be a believer. He had a very sinful, wicked lifestyle, and it's what caused someone to be shocked when they came upon him one day uh, in the latter years of his life, and he was reading a Bible. And they asked him, what in the world are you doing reading a Bible? And he said, I'm looking for loopholes. Whether he was joking or not, that certainly reflects our attitude. We're looking for loopholes all the time. The Pharisees were looking for loopholes. We hear these commands of Jesus and we think, oh my goodness, who can obey God's word? There must be loopholes. The Pharisees were looking for loopholes in the days of Christ. Listen to the first commandment there in verse 27. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, we recognize that that's from uh, the Ten Commandments. That's clearly the Seventh Commandment. And so there was the text of God's Word, but then there were the traditions that had come up alongside of it. We started talking about that last week. As the teachers described the Pharisees as they taught God's Word, they certainly put their twist on it. They emphasized certain things, and so there were traditions that had come up with this commandment. So you begin to wonder, well, they they quoted it correctly. They haven't distorted or twisted God's words, but they do have a very narrow definition A very narrow definition. They thought, all right, adultery is having sexual intimacy with anybody who is not your spouse. It's merely the physical act. Well, that's certainly part of it, but that's not all of it. You see, they emphasized a very external definition of adultery. They didn't emphasize the internal nature of the sin. Now, this shouldn't have caught them by surprise. Because God had given them not just the first seven commandments, he had given them all ten. And the tenth one about covetousness specifically says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. All right? So already, all the way back in the Ten Commandments, it was getting down to the heart. But they only focused on the external aspect of the commandment. How convenient. How convenient. We know that the law was able to work at the heart level, even in the Old Testament. But their loophole focused on the surface level. They didn't move to the heart level. They focused on the letter of the law, but they ignored the spirit of the law. They pretended that God didn't care about anything except the physical, even though he had already talked to them about the heart there in the Tenth Commandment. So this loophole made it really easy for them and for us today to say things like, well, listen, God, I haven't done anything physical. I haven't done anything external. I haven't actually physically committed adultery. So, Jesus, I don't need this sermon. They were looking around as some of you are looking around thinking, I hope you heathens are paying attention, but this sermon must be for somebody else. And Jesus says, no, this is for all of us. On the other hand, some of you hear this text and you automatically feel condemned. You automatically know that this text has an impact in your life, that you've already fallen short at some point in the past. And so you might even feel targeted. You might even feel shame as you hear God's word read because you know the shame that comes with breaking the law of God. But as I've already mentioned, we're simply working our way through the text. This is what comes up next. So this is not my sermon. This is God's sermon. God has chosen these words. And as we saw last week, Jesus doesn't let any of us off the hook. We're all on the hook. As we saw last week, as Jesus gets right down to the heart of anger, we saw that we're all murderers because we have murdered in our heart. Jesus is taking this issue of superior righteousness, not superficial righteousness, right down to the heart. We're all murderers. And we're all adulterers, men and women alike, young and old alike. We all need God's word. We all need 
the gospel. We need the cleansing that Christ provides for us through the cleansing of his word, the washing of his word. So we need the cleansing of this good news. So don't check out. Don't stop paying attention. Don't start looking for loopholes. Hear the good news through the preaching of God's word. Not only did the Pharisees narrow down, they focused on the narrow external definition of adultery. They also abused God's law to ensure that they didn't commit adultery. You see, the punishment in the Old Testament for adultery was death. So if you bring death to this one flesh union of marriage, then your flesh faces death. That's how the logic goes. And so they said, ah, let's look for a loophole. Ah, I remember Moses said something about a certificate of divorce. Moses gave permission to divorce wives, so there's the loophole. So not only do they have their tradition in verse 27, there's also verse 31. Look down at verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, just like in our day, in Jesus' day, there was debate about how can you divorce your spouse and still be right with God. They were thinking theoretically, listen, I don't want to commit adultery because that might lead to death, so here's an easy way out. You find a way to divorce your spouse, and then you can remarry the woman that you've fallen in lust with. That will make it easy, safe, and legal. And that was their attitude of that day. They had found their loophole. Well, listen, Jesus is quoting here from Deuteronomy as they quoted from Deuteronomy. He's quoting their paraphrase when they say, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. You don't have to turn there, but write down, if you're taking notes, Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. And I want to read it to you for just a moment. And I want you to listen to what God actually said in Deuteronomy. And I want you to think, are the Pharisees, are the scribes, are they actually dealing honestly with God's word? Are they actually obeying what God has said? Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife." After she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. Now, you probably were having a hard time keeping up. Did you hear the emphasis, the repeated word, and? There was a whole lot going on in those four verses. But all that the Pharisees took away from it was their certificate of divorce. That's the easy way out. If we've got our paperwork in order, then we've got our easy way out. We've got our loophole. But actually, God was protecting women in their culture. He was saying, listen, you can't just find some reason and say you don't want to be married anymore. Divorce her. Husband one divorces the wife. Wife remarries to husband two. Husband two gets mad, divorces her. Wife can't go back to husband one. She's not a piece of property to be tossed around like a volleyball between husbands. That's what was happening. And Moses, out of the hardness of their hearts, he allowed and permitted a certificate of divorce. And so Jesus says, oh no, you're misunderstanding what's going on. They're thinking this is a get-out-of-jail-free card. They thought they had found their loophole. Divorce for any cause. That's what that phrase about some indecency. They had been debating about that between uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, all the way since the time of Moses. They debated what does it mean for any cause. Can we just divorce a wife because she burned the toast? Can we get mad and just say, well, there's somebody else I'm interested in, so I'm going to give you a certificate of divorce? Or did there actually have to be uh, sexual immorality? That was the debate of their day. God had given these divorce laws as a protection for women, but perverse, lustful men had corrupted it to the point that it just worked in their favor. They said, as long as we've got our paperwork right, we're fine. Now, as many of you already know, Jesus goes into far greater detail on the subject of divorce in Matthew chapter 19. We're going to give the subject a fuller treatment then this morning. I just want you to see the connection between lust, adultery, and divorce. These are not separate issues. We have headings in our Bible, and so we might think that has nothing to do with the verses that just came before it. But Jesus is showing this is the trajectory. These go together. They're on the same path. 
God has forbidden, divorce, uh, forbidden adultery, and in Jesus' day and in our own, many people think they have found their loophole. They think, I'll get a divorce in order to prevent committing adultery. But Jesus takes the matter far, far deeper. You see, this isn't just a surface-level issue, a get-your-paperwork-in-order kind of issue. This is not superficial righteousness. This is superior righteousness. Citizens of Christ's kingdom must have superior righteousness. Well, with that, we get at the heart of adultery. Verses 27 and 28. You have heard it that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Oh my. Jesus takes away the loophole and he goes straight for the heart. Jesus is getting our attention with what he is saying. It's not enough to simply not commit physical adultery. Jesus says it's not even enough to not commit mental adultery. He says you can't let your eyes linger in the places that your hands will not go. Jesus has already taught us that it's possible to murder with our words, and now he's making clear it is possible to commit adultery in our hearts. You see, we want to only focus on who's in our bed, but Jesus wants us to focus on who's in our hearts. Where do your eyes look? Jesus refers to a long, sustained look. It's not merely acknowledging that someone is an attractive human being. The Bible is not forbidding that. It's when we linger longer. It's the deep-seated lust that can develop so quickly. It's not the first look, but it is the second It is the look that lingers, the look that cherishes, the look that meditates, the look that imagines what it might be like. Before you've even processed your thoughts, Jesus says you've already, already committed adultery. It all happens so fast. In a moment, your eyes linger too long, your mind races to places it ought not go, you complete the second look, and you hear in that moment the pounding of the judge's gavel, guilty, 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 we're all guilty of adultery. The judge cries out, you're an adulterer. And so you cry out to the judge, judge, I haven't done anything. Oh God, I didn't actually do it. I never actually touched her. Nothing physical happened. But Jesus says, oh, in the heart, we're all guilty. Can any of us measure up to our high king's standards? You see, it all started with just one look for King David. You remember the story of King David? It was in the spring of the year when kings go off to war, but King David stayed at home. Late one evening, he's patrolling on the top of the palace. He's looking down upon the city, and his eyes look not once, not twice. His eyes linger upon Bathsheba. Before the night is over, David has ruined his entire life. He's brought catastrophe upon his kingdom. Most of you know the story. If not, you can read about it in 2 Samuel 11 and 12 and then go back and read Psalm 51 that goes with that. But I want to ask you, do you think that David woke up that morning thinking, today's the day. Today is the day that I'm going to ruin my life. Today's the day that I'm going to get a woman pregnant. This child is going to die. I'm going to bring death and destruction upon my house, my other children. I'm bringing catastrophe upon the kingdom. I'm going to put into motion events that will eventually destroy everything that I've worked for, all for a few moments of pleasure. You think David woke up that morning with those thoughts in his mind? No. Neither do we. Neither do we start out the day thinking today's the day that I ruin it all. Today's the day that I sin so grievously against God that I'm not sure any of it can be fixed. Some of you may be thinking, why does it have to be this way? Why does it have to be so hard? Why is Jesus raising the standard so high that lust is on the same level with actual adultery? Why does this matter so much? Lust matters because sex matters. Sex matters because marriage matters. Now, some of you, I understand, are already getting squeamish. uh, Parents, pastors should talk about it. Parents, grandparents, we should not shy away in these conversations with children and grandchildren. You see, the world is ready to teach them every sort of distortion, every destructive lie that Satan will suggest. The world is ready to teach it to our children and grandchildren. 
We cannot be silent. Here is the truth. The truth is that sex is a good gift from God. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something that we should blush about. God has designed this good gift, but it has one, and only one legitimate outlet, one and only one proper avenue for expression, and that is in marriage. Marriage is a one flesh union. In marriage, you share everything, the joys and the triumphs, the sorrows and the trials, and yes, even your bodies and pleasure. This is God's design. But Satan always distorts God's good design. Satan tells you that your thoughts don't matter. Satan tells you that your desires don't matter. But what does God say? Listen to James 1, verses 14 and 15. God says each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. Do you hear what God is teaching us? The sins that so easily beset us, they're like a child growing in conception until they fully are brought forth in birth. You see, the problem, our greatest enemy, is not external, it is internal. It's within our hearts. If you weren't able to be with us last Sunday, I encourage you to go online Fine last Sunday sermon because we have much greater detail, many scriptures that we referred to last week about the heart. We keep moving. If it's a sin to do something, then it's a sin to desire to do it. If it would be sinful for you to carry out that desire, then the desire itself is also sinful. Do you understand? Sometimes, even people within Christianity will tell you it's not about the desires, it's only if you actually carry it out. That's not what the Bible says. If it's a sin to do it, then it's a sin to desire to do it. That's the truth about lust and all of its forms. Lust, we often think in our culture and our society today, it's most commonly expressed in pornography. It's available everywhere. That's not the only way. Lust expresses itself in a thousand different ways. And the truth about lust is that lust promises freedom, but it only enslaves you. You see, lust is not some genie in the bottle making all of your dreams come true. Lust is more like the prison warden who's forcing you into hard labor every moment of the day. Lust is the gateway drug to adultery. Oh, how serious adultery is. We don't take it to be so serious. One, because we've seen it up close. Perhaps you've committed it. We've seen it in our families and our loved ones. We see it on TV. We see it in entertainment. We see it everywhere. We have minimized adultery. But adultery breaks God's law in so many ways. Adultery is theft because you're taking what doesn't belong to you. Adultery is idol worship because you're worshiping your desires instead of the creator who made you. Adultery is idolatry. So you see, lust, lust is just the beginning. It's a gateway drug to adultery, and it's a gateway drug to divorce. That's what Jesus is doing in verses 31 and 32. Divorce is the logical conclusion of lust in a broken world. You see, the world will call someone brave for acting on their lust and letting it ruin their lives. Make no mistake, just in case you're wondering, before we get to Matthew 19, Jesus doesn't command you to get a divorce. It is permitted in certain circumstances, but it's never commanded. God's word is for our good. Jesus calls us to take sin seriously. Look at verses 29 and 30. Verses 29 and 30. If we understand the weight of our sin, Jesus calls us to take sin seriously. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better. It's better that you lose one of your members, then that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Do you hear how serious our sin is? We see this all over the scriptures, and yet we so often minimize this in the Christian life. Sin is not a big deal. We don't want to talk about it. It makes us kind of un- uncomfortable. It's kind of weird. We're, we're in Christ. We're saved. Why are we still talking about sin? Hasn't he freed us from it? Yes, but we still wrestle with sin. Sin still has consequences. 
And so we must have the radical resolve to remove sin. The radical resolve to remove sin. You see, Jesus says it is necessary to deal with our sinful desires, to deal with our sinful temptations. He says it's necessary or else. Do you hear the language at the end of the verse? Twice at the end of verse 29, at the end of verse 30, he says it's better that you deal with your sin than your whole body go into hell. Make no mistake, Jesus isn't saying that your sins can't be forgiven. Jesus isn't treating these sins as if they're the unpardonable sin, that if you commit these sins as a Christian, that somehow there's no hope of forgiveness. That's not what he's saying. But he is getting our attention. He's using shocking language so that we will listen. Just as we saw last week, if your life is characterized by unrepentant, uncontrolled anger, then you should have serious doubts if you are in the kingdom of heaven. If your life is consumed and controlled by these kinds of thoughts and desires and actions, you should have serious concerns about your soul. Jesus isn't saying these sins can't be forgiven, but they must be dealt with. Jesus says, if anything causes you to sin, to stumble, your Bible may say, it's a picture of an animal trap, right? As the animal pushes the mechanism and he is completely consumed by the trap, there is no hope. He's caught and he can't get out. It's the picture of that sin that ensnares you every single time. Jesus says you must deal with it. Deal with it dramatically. Deal with it fully. Deal with it now. Does that sound too extreme? The only reason that dealing with sin sounds extreme to our ears today is because we misunderstand the severity of sin. We misunderstand the nature of our temptation. You see, these temptations are like gangrene to your soul. Have you ever known someone who had gangrene? If it started with a wound, before you know it, it's beginning to spread. The doctors come in and say, I'm so sorry, but we must amputate right below your knee in order to save your life. What if the person said, no, I really like my leg. I really like my foot. I would really, really, really miss my left toe. And you say, that's crazy. You're going to die if you don't amputate right now to save your life. You must deal with it now. Jesus says that's how foolish we sound when we refuse to deal with our sin. If we don't deal with our sin, then we have serious questions about whether or not we are actually citizens of the kingdom of heaven. These temptations are like gangrene to our souls. Now, many people throughout history have taken Jesus literally at his words. They've begun to gouge out their eyes. They've begun to mutilate their bodies. Is that what Jesus is asking? No, please don't think that. Clearly, he's using hyperbole. He's using dramatic speech. He's not telling us to literally gouge out our eyes, to literally cut off our hands, to literally cut off our feet, as Jesus says in other places. Because would that actually deal with the problem? You can be as blind as anybody in this world and still be filled with lust. You can have no hands. You can have no feet. You can be unable to move, but in your heart, you're still filled with lust. There's a church father named Origen. He took this literally, and he mutilated himself. He had himself uh, emasculated, but he still had to deal with his sin. It didn't actually fix the problem of the heart. You can be blind and maimed and still filled with lust. I appreciate the way one man said, we are to deal drastically with sin. We must not pamper it, flirt with it, enjoy nibbling a little of it around the edges. We must deal severely with our sin. John Stott suggests that while we don't literally pluck out our eyes or cut off our hands or cut off our feet, we should live as if we had. And by that, he means that we should live as if we had no eyes. If our eyes are the problem, if the things we are looking at are the problem, then stop looking. Pretend that you don't have eyes, that you can't actually look at those things. If your hand is causing you to sin, if you're going places with your feet that you ought not to go, stop. Cut it out. Stop now. Hands that are removed can't touch things that cause you to sin. Feet that are removed can't go to the places that tempt you to stumble. Job understood these things. Job understood that it all begins with the eyes. Where the eyes go, the heart will follow. Job knew that if his heart was enticed towards a woman, it would bring all sorts of ruin and destruction in his life. 
So Job said in chapter 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes to not look lustfully upon a young woman. By the way, in case you've forgotten, Job was not a young man filled with uh, hormones when he wrote that. He was an older man. He had many children. He had great land and wealth and property. And even still, Job knew the importance of controlling his eyes. What would it look like for you to take seriously the temptations that you face? What would it look like for you, dear sir, to deal with the sin in your life? What would it look like for you, dear sister, if you actually took seriously the temptations that you face? Listen, I'm very hesitant to lay out a list of laws that I apply in my own life and to apply to you because we're all different. I don't want to give laws where God has not given laws, but I'm quick to implement them in my own life. I've placed precautions and protections in my own life. How foolish would we be to not do that? Think about the military. If our military did not have guards upon the walls, if they were not watching around the fortress, how vulnerable would they be to not have guards on duty? But how often do we foolishly not put up guards in our lives? We don't put up protections and safeguards in our own lives. Now, you may think that this all just sounds too serious. You say something like, I thought Christianity was a relationship of joy. I thought there was joy in following Jesus. Well, of course there is. But our joy will not come by seeking to please ourselves. Our joy will not come in seeking to satisfy ourselves. Our joy is on the other side of the cross. Our joy erupts from the empty tomb. Our joy is in following Jesus Christ, but not in following ourselves. Listen, in Christ, there is freedom. You must understand that. I don't know all of your stories. I know some of your stories. I know some of the things that have happened in your lives. And some of you have walked down the difficult roads that are addressed here in these verses of lust and adultery and divorce. And my concern for you today is not to go back and feel guilty about things that have happened in the past. Because in Christ, there is no condemnation. If you have taken these sins to Christ, Christ has dealt with them. My concern is for you in the present and moving forward. My concern is for you and your children and your grandchildren that they understand the Word of God, that they know there is freedom found in Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning, you're caught in the vicious trap of pornography. You might even be contemplating an affair. Understand that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. You can overcome these temptations through Christ. There is victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. But there's death and death only in your lusts. Do you remember what Pastor Laramie read earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 6? That long list of sins. Jesus says, do not be deceived. The sexually immoral will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He goes through this list. But then what does he say? Such were some of you. Christ can make the difference. Christ can change you. Christ can radically give you freedom in your life. This is the power of the cross. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sins that so easily ensnare you are broken by the power of Jesus. Jesus provides victory over our sins. It's not just that you can have hope that you might be a little less defeated this week, that you might be a little less discouraged this week, that you might struggle just a little bit less with sin. No, Jesus provides freedom. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is not what you will find in the world. This is not the lies of Satan. Satan loves to blackmail us. Satan loves to manipulate us. Satan is the accuser. He loves to take our sins to God. You can hear him now, can't you? Satan says, did you see what they did, God? Did you see what that man did? How many times has he promised to quit, God? He's promised that it would be the last time, but there he goes again, God. God, you are just. You must punish sin, ought you, God? How long are you going to wait? Punish him now. That's what Satan cries out. Satan, our accuser, but up steps our advocate, Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ silences our accusers. Jesus declares, no, Father, this one is mine. Father, when you look at them, don't see their sins. See my righteousness. This is the good news of Jesus. If you're looking for that 
freedom, that cleansing that comes through Christ alone, it can be yours today through Jesus. Last week as we began this study of this section of the Sermon on the Mount, we thought about the law and I I reminded you that it's not just the negative, there's also the positive. It's not just don't do that, but there's the do this instead. So don't murder people with your words. Don't be filled with anger, but seek to have positive, wholesome relationships with people. That was what we saw last week. This week, it's not just the negative, don't commit adultery. Don't let your thoughts go there. It's also positively, think on the right things. If you're busy getting caught up in thinking on the wrong, start thinking on the right. Philippians 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Christ is able to strengthen you, to give you the power to think on the right things, to not be consumed by the wrong. Listen to the good news from Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness which is idolatry. Christ gives us the answers in his word. He tells us how to put off the flesh, put on the righteousness that he provides for us. We think about this command of verse 20, to have a superior righteousness. Christ provides that superior righteousness. All you have to do is cry out to him today. If not for the first time, then for the millionth time, saying, Christ, I need you again. I need your help. I need your cleansing. If we had more time, I would love to show you all the different ways the Scriptures speak to the power of Christ over our sins. Even as discouraging as this text has been to study and meditate on this week, I've been so encouraged by seeing the power of God at work through His Scriptures, of reading testimonies of people who have been set free by the power of the Gospel. I don't want you to leave here today burdened down by this text. I want you to leave here encouraged by the Gospel that Jesus provides by the cleansing, the freedom that Jesus provides. If you're caught up in the clutches of these types of sins today, don't try to handle it alone. Come to your pastors. We're here to minister God's word to you, to help you have victory over these sins through Christ. Never forget what our Savior tells us in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins, to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I wonder this morning if you mourn over the sins that are mentioned here in this passage. Be reminded that Christ has said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Would you seek comfort today in Jesus Christ, for he indeed will hold us fast. Let's pray. Father, this is such a weighty matter, yet you are so good to not leave us alone in our sins. You're so good to give us the strength and the power to overcome these sins, not in our own strength, but in the power, the strength that you've provided through Jesus Christ. And I'm fully aware that there are many here today who are wrestling with these types of sins, but you gladly give strength by your Spirit through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray for all who are here today who do not know Christ, that they would seek him They would cry out to Christ today that they would receive the salvation that you provide through Christ alone. But for the dear saints who have walked this road and they feel defeated, they feel that they can have no victory, may they be reminded that you do indeed provide victory over sin through Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. As we respond to what God has said in his word, be encouraged by this thought that no matter how difficult the temptation is, no matter how defeated you may feel, Christ will hold us fast. Would you stand as we sing?
may be seated. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward as we collect our offering today. Brother David, would you pray for us this morning?
Because of the freedom that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ, we are able to boldly approach the throne of grace and take our prayer concerns to Him. As you see each week in our worship guide, there are several things that we can be praying about as a church. One of those ways to pray is for the sake of the gospel to go forth. And so we pray uh, this morning for the nation of Burkina Faso. You see that there in the worship guide. You can read more information about that country there in northeast Africa. We also want to pray for uh, the gospel to abound among us. Normally we pray for local churches right around us. This morning we're going to pray for the church plant uh, in Hendersonville, Tennessee that we voted as a church last week to help support with part of our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And so I encourage you to be in prayer for them. We don't have cards for them this week. We just want you to make it a matter and a priority of prayer. Uh, particularly praying for them as they seek a permanent pastor as that church is getting started. Pray God's blessings upon them. We also want to pray for our nation, for our government. We want to pray for our local uh, community. Uh, But we also want to pray for one another as a church. And one of those prayer needs uh, that some of you may have heard about is Miss Margie Braswell. Um, She is currently in the hospital. She had a fall. I believe also has pneumonia. Um, At the moment, I don't have a ton more information from that. I believe they're attempting to get her home soon. Uh, But once I get a better update for you, I will certainly send out an email to let you know. Uh, But for those of you who hadn't heard at least a little bit, please be in prayer for Miss Margie and uh, pray that the Lord will be with that whole family during this time. So many things to pray about. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you for the privilege of coming to you in prayer We don't approach you in our own strength and our own righteousness, for we do not deserve to enter your presence. But because of what you've done for us through Christ, we can boldly come and tell you all of our burdens, tell you our needs. Lord, we pray, we desire, we long to see the gospel go forth to the ends of the earth. So we pray for the nation of Burkina Faso there in northeast Africa. We see that they are a majority Muslim nation And we understand that taken to its uh, logical conclusions, that religion seeks to destroy all others. So Lord, we pray that you bring about an end to that false teaching, a teaching that would seek to lead astray many, many people. We do pray for those who are peaceful, who may uh, adopt that religion by their culture. We pray that they would see the light of the gospel and they would be saved. We pray for those who are professing evangelicals there in that nation, that you would strengthen their churches, that you would plant healthy churches there with healthy, uh, flourishing pastors who would help them to grow in the Word of God. And we, see, we desire to see that nation flourish in the gospel. We want to see the gospel abound here at home as well. So we pray for Covenant of Grace Baptist Church there in Hendersonville, Tennessee. And they are a young church plant, and we're grateful for the privilege to help play a, Paul, a small part in supporting them, Lord. But, Lord, we pray that you would uh, help them as they seek a permanent pastor. We pray that you would uh, send your man, that you would make it very clear who you would have, and that he would lead them for many, many years according to your word. And we pray that you would bless and flourish that church. We pray for our nation here at home this morning, specifically praying for the judicial branch of our government at all levels from the U.S. Supreme Court on down. We pray that they would administer justice rightly, that they would handle the law of our land correctly, and that you would be glorified by the application of just laws all across our nation. We do pray for our local community as we desire to do very often. We pray for the city of Palmetto. This week praying specifically uh, for the Easter egg hunt that our city is hosting this Saturday. We're thankful for those uh, in our city's leadership who seek to do family-friendly events. And we appreciate their willingness and their urging of us to have uh, churches present there. So we thank you for this opportunity that we can go and that we can meet our neighbors, our families here in the community, and that we can show them the love of Christ and let them know that there's a church that loves them and wants to welcome them and minister God's word to them. And so we pray that you would bless this event this Saturday. But Father in heaven, we pray especially for uh, the saints of our church. There are many that we could name, and you know all of the needs of our church, but we want to pray especially for a few, including Miss Margie Braswell, that you would uh, give the doctors the best wisdom and the family wisdom and how to proceed forth with, uh, with her sickness right now. And we pray that you would restore her to greater health very soon. 
We pray for our sister Pat as she continues to, to struggle with her health concerns, and we desire to see Pat uh, strengthened and able to worship with us. And so I pray that you would encourage her spirit even this very morning when she so desired to be here. We pray for our brother Mike as he's caring for his parents and for so many others who are doing likewise. Dana caring for her parents, Doug caring for Carol, others in our congregation who are seeking to be faithful, to show the love of Christ even at home. And we pray that you would strengthen them through that, Lord. We're so encouraged as you continue to bless our church to send new faces to us, Lord, that we uh, seek to build upon your word, and we know that your word is faithful, and it will not return void. And so we pray you continue to build us up by your word and by your spirit. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. We take confidence knowing that the Lord is pleased with our worship as we have drawn near to him this morning through the Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit. We're so glad you joined us this morning. For those of you who are visitors, again, for the first time or maybe for the first in a long time, you'll see there in the pew in front of you a little green notepad where you could, uh, if you don't mind, provide a little information that we might be able to follow up with you and talk to you this week and let you know how grateful we are that you joined us today. But as the Lord uh, sends us out to serve him, we have many opportunities, many announcements, and so I'll try to move through them quickly. As you know, we've had a cookie fundraiser for our summer family retreat, and good news is that the cookies are here. They're in the foyer. They're just waiting for you. I'm so glad that they're not hot and fresh out of the oven, or you would have really tuned me out and only been thinking about them, but they are there. If you put in an order, they're out there. Lindsay will be out there to make sure everybody who, gets, who made an order gets their order. We do have a few extras. I believe just a couple of half dozen batches. They're $6 each, and so uh, Lindsay would be glad to help connect you with those if you're interested in cookies, but you didn't order any. Also on the table uh, here on my right side out there in the foyer, there's some farm fresh eggs that Dixie has brought and donated. So if you are interested in farm fresh eggs, if you will make a donation to the summer family retreat, those eggs can go home with you. And uh, I know she appreciates you helping her with that. Uh, secondly, as I already mentioned about our Annie Armstrong Easter uh, offering, we voted last Sunday in our conference as a church uh, to support those missionaries and different uh, ministries that I've already mentioned to you. I won't go into detail about all of that again, but we still encourage you uh, to give sacrificially as you're able uh, for the cause of seeing the gospel go forth across North America. Uh, if you have questions about those different ministries, we'd be glad to talk with you about that. We'll keep this offering open uh, at least a few weeks into April, but we encourage you to give as you are able. This uh, Tuesday night, excuse me, Tuesday during the day at 10 o'clock, our ladies talk, uh, a ministry of encouragement and prayer for widows and previously married ladies will meet in the fellowship hall at 10 o'clock this Tuesday morning. And then Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock will be our community Bible study, continuing to work our way through uh, the book of Philippians. And so even if you haven't joined us for any previous sessions, we encourage you to join us this Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night we will have prayer meeting and we would encourage you to join us with that as we uh, have an even more devoted time to prayer and we would love for you to join us with that. But this week is Holy Week as you know and so Friday night we will have our Facing the Cross service in the chapel. It will be at 6 o'clock and we would encourage you to make your plans to join us. If you've already made other plans, there's still time to cancel them and for you to join us Friday night at 6 o'clock. As you know, uh, Good Friday and Easter are really a two-part service. The first part is Friday night, focusing on the cross of Christ. And Sunday morning, we will gather joyously, triumphantly here in the sanctuary, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. So this Friday, we encourage you to join us for that, our Facing the Cross service. Saturday, as I already mentioned in prayer, we have the, the City of Palmetto's uh, Easter egg hunt. If you're planning to come uh, and would be able to help as a volunteer just with some yard games, things that we'll do for fun while we're there, let me know today. That would be helpful in planning. Let me know if you plan to come to that. If you're able uh, to come and wear your Rama t-shirt, then uh, we encourage you to do that. And then right after that, we'll just load it all up and come over here to the North Lawn and we'll have a whole hog barbecue fellowship. Nothing screams the Lord is risen like eating pork guilt-free because we're not Catholic. But that's another story for another day. We're going to have a whole hog barbecue fellowship. And so we encourage you, make your plans. We'll have the, the yard games, all that. We will have a wonderful time. But as I mentioned, Sunday morning, of course, we will gather here. We'll have corporate uh, Sunday school downstairs. Pastor Laramie will be teaching. We'll have a delightful time 
focusing our attention on our Lord's resurrection, and we'll gather up here for our worship service at 11. Now, as we have uh, done the last few years, we have a devotional for you this week, even to go along with your normal Bible readings uh, to focus your minds on the cross of Christ. And so you'll find that on the table out there. It's a little different this year. Rather than us writing the devotional for you, uh, through G3 Ministries, we have a free devotional that was written by uh, fellow pastors at another church in Texas. And we wanted to share that with you and make it available to you. And so we would encourage you, pick up a copy of that on the table out there on your way out. Um, I've got one more. Is there anything else? My wife has been giving me hand signals in the back, making sure I don't forget anything. Is there anything else I'm forgetting that you know of? All right. In anticipation of Easter, we attempt to learn a new hymn of the faith about the Lord's resurrection. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights, we have been learning that. Uh, but for those of you who are not, we want to give you at least one opportunity to hear it before next Sunday so that when we begin to sing our Lord's praises, you don't sit there looking at us like a bump on a pickle. So Pastor Laramie is going to come and lead us in a wonderful hymn called Thine Be the Glory. It'll give you a chance to become familiar with it this morning. And then I will dismiss us with a benediction from God's word. Let's stand together. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun, and less is the victory thou or death hast won angels in bright raiment roll the stone away kept the folded grave clothes where thy body lay thine is the glory risen conquering sun and less is the victory thou or death hast won lo jesus meets us risen from the tomb lovingly he greets us scatters fear and gloom let his church with gladness hymns of triumph sing for her lord now liveth death hath lost its sting thine be the glory risen conquering sun and less is the victory thou or death hast won no more we doubt thee glorious prince of life life is not without thee aid us in our strife make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love bring us safe through jordan to thy home above thine is the glory risen conquering sun and less is the victory thou God has called us to worship by his word, and he dismisses us with his word, and he gives us the ability to obey his word. Hear the benediction from 1 Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, 
not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger of all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Go in peace.